So one big headline that's emerged with regards to the Russia-Ukraine conflict is Russia announcing that they're keeping their nuclear arms and nuclear alert up now. What does that mean? Russia has over 6,000 nuclear weapons at its disposal, but here's their nuclear deterrent. We break down that for you. First is Topolem, which means white poplar in Russian. It's an intercontinental ballistic missile, the range of which is 11,000 kilometers. Usually in these kind of missiles, the minimum range is about 5,500 kilometers. It's only the United States, Russia and China that have these missiles. Let's tell you also about uh, the Bulava missile. It's a submarine launched nuclear missile. It has a range of 8,000 kilometers. It's uh, in fact a missile that was developed for the Russian Navy and deployed in 2013 on the new Borai class of ballistic missile nuclear submarines. Let's get you also the other big arsenal that Putin has, that Russia has. Kinral, which means dagger in Russian. It's an air-launched nuclear missile with a range of 3,000 kilometers. It's a hypersonic cruise missile. It has a claimed range, as I mentioned there, of more than 2,000, roughly 3,000 kilometers, Mach 10 speed, and even the ability to perform evasive maneuvers at every stage of its flight. So these are, in fact, some of the nuclear missiles, some of the nuclear arsenal with Putin, with Russia, which has now been put on alert, a move that's been condemned by the world as well. Let's also, in fact, get you this morning all the updates that you need to know. One positive development or one that seems to signal some level of hope is Ukraine agreeing to peace talks. It's a welcoming sign, but that doesn't mean that Russia is backed off in any way. The Russian offensive is far from over. Day five, Russian missile attacks have intensified, with the Russian focus now on destroying Ukraine's oil supplies as well. The battle for Kharkiv ended in disappointment for Russia. Ukrainians are putting up a fight like never before. They've retaken the city after a very fierce battle on the streets. Russians were also not able to make strides in the capital city of Kiev. The Ukraine president has also asked the United Nations to strip Russia of its Security Council vote. Remember, Russia is a permanent member of the UNSC. Ukraine is also rallying countries to condemn Russia's unprovoked actions on its sovereign soil. It's also submitted an application against Russia to the International Court of Justice, ordering Russia to cease military activities immediately. As far as the United Nations is concerned, you're going to be seeing a UNGA emergency meet. The General Assembly coming together to discuss what's happening in Ukraine. Go back home. You have nothing to find here. We hope uh, this night will be quiet. Uh, we hope uh, the Russians uh, take the decision, move back to Russia. They have nothing to find here in our home. And uh, But uh, I see so many people. We are everybody proud of our, our army of Ukrainians who defend our city, defend our homes, defend our, our family and uh, uh, respect for everyone, everyone ready to fight. Fight for our country. So day five of the invasion, where do things stand right now? How far has Russia progressed? As I mentioned, Ukraine really putting up a fight back like none anybody expected. But here's how things stand. And just stay with me while we explain right now. What you see on your screens in the yellow here, Crimea, of course, then you've got some parts uh, of uh, uh, Western Ukraine here that are all marked in yellow, Eastern Ukraine as well, many parts. Uh, these are, in fact, Russian-occupied Ukrainian territory. These are the areas where Russia has managed to progress forward. And this is, in fact, parts that Russia has managed to also take over. What you see here, marked right here in this particular part, are the key reported airstrikes as well that have been held. Besides that, uh, key reported ground and naval attacks have been happening in two cities, particularly from where we're also getting images. One is in the capital city of Kiev. The other is in Kharkiv, which is the second largest city in Ukraine. Russian troops tried to paint this area yellow. They haven't managed to yet because Ukraine also has been putting up a fight back in Kharkiv as well as Kiev. So this is where things stand right now. Russia, yes, has managed to progress in many parts. It is not just limited to one region of uh, eastern Ukraine, but it's spread across. But at this point, the fight continues for two cities, for Kharkiv as well as for the capital of Kiev. Now, amid air raids, missile explosions and tanks firing shells, 
It's the citizen, the common Ukrainian who's gearing up to battle the Russian forces. Civilians in Kyiv's territorial defense centers are putting up their last stand. And it's amazing to see you've got youngsters, techies, even teenagers who've come out now. They're arming themselves to the resistance and saying that we're going to push every Russian troop out of our soil. Civilians in Kiev's territorial defense center putting up their last stand. Youngsters, techies and even teens arming themselves, donning combat fatigue. Ready to battle the invading force. Telling India today with boyish enthusiasm that they are ready and raring. Slava Ukraina. Yes, they are ready to fight. You see there, he's a young guy. He probably is very, very young. He's probably 17, 18, but they're all ready to fight for the country. Amid air raids, missile attacks, and tanks firing shell, the common Ukrainian is resisting hard. <laughs> Olga, can you, are you also ready to fight for Ukraine? Yes, I'm ready to help to fight. At least I can sort out the maps. Alex, uh, what is your profession normally? <laughs> I'm working in public relations. And right in, now, in and, and, and right now, you see, he's holding <laughs> holding a real Kalashnikov, a public relations officer, because his country needs it. If I won't make it, no one make it. So I'm here to protect my wife my family, myself, my country from the Russian invasion. I'm an IT guy, actually. I'm not a military guy, but I also have the gun. And uh, all of my friends, they got, uh, they come to government and government uh, 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 take them to the militia and give guns. So we will fight for our land and we will kill all, our, all Russians. It is not often that the world sees civilians in full combat gear. But the war has come home to one of the most populous and thriving European cities. Sparking a full-fledged urban warfare, bordering in guerrilla tactics by residents, many of whom are heading home from overseas to join the war. I want to join the army. I want to fight. I want to live on my earth, in my Ukraine. And I don't want to die our soldiers, our Ukrainian soldiers. They are very brave. And we all, all the Ukrainians, women, pray for them. Russia knows the pitfalls. Hence, it is sending its troops, disguised as Ukrainian soldiers, to crush the resistance. But many of them have been nabbed. The urban warfare now threatens to prolong the war and make it even bloodier. With Rajesh Pawar in Kiev, Bureau Report, India Today. And in a development that has given us some sense of hope that things could finally end, Ukraine has agreed to hold talks to have dialogue with Russia, and this is at the Belarus border. Ukraine has agreed to, in fact, hold these talks at a time when Russian President Vladimir Putin announced a nuclear alert, Belarus held a referendum on Sunday to adopt a new constitution. Interestingly, that would ditch its non-nuclear status at a time when the country has become essentially a launchpad for Russian troops invading Ukraine and marching on Kiev. What really does this development of non-nuclear status mean? It translates to the fact that Putin, if he wants to move his nuclear weapons into Belarus and then into Ukraine, can go ahead and do so. The Ukrainian delegation would in fact meet with the Russian delegation without any preconditions. It's going to happen near the Pripyat River. The area is located right across the frontier between Belarus and Ukraine. And the waterway then interestingly runs down to the Chernobyl exclusion zone in the south. The agreement for talks is a result 
of a conversation by phone between Ukraine President Zelensky and the Belarus President Alexander Lukashenko. The development comes after Kremlin had earlier sent a delegation to Belarus saying that uh, it was ready to start peace negotiations with Ukraine. This was in the Gomel city. Ukraine's President Zelensky had then rejected Moscow's offer. Now he said he's willing to try talks but is skeptical of Russia and whether anything will really emerge from this dialogue. So where exactly will these talks happen? We don't have a date at this point or a specific venue, but the agreed point is along, in fact, the Ukraine-Belarus border. Now, in fact, if you look at the particular area, it's at the Pripyat River, and the interesting fact about this river is that it goes further south into Chernobyl as well, the nuclear power plant that's now taken over by Russia. Now, it is proposed that the talks will happen at the Ukraine-Belarus border at a neutral location, and this is been uh, confirmed after the Belarus president had a conversation with their neighbors with Ukraine and then finally it looks like talks will happen but as I mentioned there's no specific time or date given we will be tracking this very very closely. Now as the Russian invasion of Ukraine enters into the fifth day there's an outpouring of support of solidarity with Ukraine and particularly with Ukrainian President Zelensky. Across the world, people have been voicing their solidarity for Zelensky. And it's because of images like this. Zelensky's leadership acumen, his valor, his courage has been hailed by many. Two images that you see on your screens and they're as contradictory as can get. On your left, as you can see, there's Russian President Vladimir Putin. He's sitting on an extremely long table. At the very end of that table is Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and Chief of the General Staff, Valery Gerasimov, uh, at the other end. They're clearly having serious conversation, very serious gestures, nothing beyond the professional field. On the right of your screens, you see there President Zelensky with his defense minister, Oleksoy Reznikov. This image shows that despite hardships and an apathetic condition, Zelensky looks calm and composed, shares a very close relationship with his deputies. A perfect example, these two images that you see on your screens there, of how different Putin and Zelensky are in regards to treating their defense ministers in their leadership styles and how they choose to govern.